the moment that you have been waiting for. <laughs> to hear the encouragement from our speaker this morning, our pastor, Reverend John Scott. Reverend John. Good morning, family. The moment you have been waiting for. I love that. I love that. I just want to add my own words of welcome from my heart and from the moment I've been waiting for, that I wait for every week when I, I stand and face you and just feel the love pouring out of you and feel the love being reciprocated from my own beingness uh, to just to touch, to heal, to bless, to, to love and liberate and prosper everyone that it touches. And it extends beyond this center to just fill the entire cosmos with the beauty of God across the face of this earth. And so we, we welcome to our hearts to those in the frozen north. Uh, it's about 30 degrees here in sunny and beautiful Jamaica with poncetias ablaze and golden dewdrops on the petals. And if you can at all, come on down and join us. You feel it? Can I hear an amen from the church here? Amen. <laughs> My encouragement today uh, is inspired by um, a bit of Bible trivia, which I wanted, to, I wanted to share with you. And if you have any friends who are hot Bible uh, scholars, you can impress them with this piece of information. Did you know about the, the center of the Bible? At the very center of the Bible is Psalm 118. It's at the very center, at least in the King James Version. There are 594 chapters before Psalm 118 and 594 chapters after Psalm 118. And this is an interesting piece of, of synchronicity because if you add 594 and 594, you get 1188. Now, here's the interesting piece of synchronicity. The verse at the very center of the Bible is Psalm 118, verse 8. Got it? 1188. And you can check it out. So let me read to you that verse from the very center of the scriptures. And I want you to really listen to this. Quote, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. So when we put God at the center of our lives instead of on the periphery, we find that life flows effortlessly and joyously. And that's why I've titled my talk this morning, my encouragement, God at your center. But before I want to share, to share a, a, a very amusing uh, incident that happened uh, at the university that Reverend Michael Record and myself and Reverend Ann and uh, Miss Carol Charlton attend every Tuesday at the, the female prison on South Camp Road in Kingston and the male prison at Tower Street. It's a university for us because we learn as much, I think, as, as the participants. In this last cohort, which just uh, finished in December, I was talking to them about being focused and keeping God at the center whatever God, they conceive God to be. And I said, you know, when you have that focus, nothing will keep you from your pursuit of the truth that sets you free. And just as a matter of interest, we have 12 classes for each cohort, and they are obliged to attend at least 10 classes if they want to receive a certificate. So they can only miss two classes. And they miss classes for various reasons. They've been called to court or, they, you know, whatever. But one of the reasons that they miss classes is that sometimes um, a, 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 an officer, a warder, will lock up the, the section that they're in and for whatever reason is best known to him, keep it locked. And they say, but I have to go to class. Well, I mean, I open the gate today. So every cell block has its own enclosure and it's, there's a very high fence 
topped with barbed wire, as you know, the this, this scroll, this scroll of barbed wire. And he had missed two classes and was determined that he was not going to miss any others. But at one class, about three classes before the end, the warder refused to open the gate, so he climbed the fence. <laughs> Much to the amusement and chairs of the entire cell block, they were outside cheering. Of course, you know, he could have been shot, he could have been um, hit down with a baton or whatever it is that they use for, for maintaining discipline. But he said, nothing is keeping me from my pursuit and my focus on what it is I want to attain. He said, I've never had a certificate in my life, and nobody is going to stop me. And so the guard allowed him to climb it. And when he got to the very top, he said, come on down, I'll let you out through the gate. <laughs> <laughs> only, only in Jamaica, only in beautiful Jamaica. So keeping God at your center is really um, the focus of what I want to share today, because I think it is the, it is the, the essence of, of the season that we are, we are about to celebrate, or that we're in the middle of celebrating. Ernest Holmes, the founder of this great teaching known as the science of mind, wrote, and I quote, in our ignorance, we try to find our center outside the self. This can never be. The ancients said that God's center is everywhere and his circumference nowhere. We are like the upward thrust of a wave. We look about seeing other waves, apparently disassociated from us, but underneath is the one ocean pushing all waves upward. End of that quote from Ernest Holmes. So most people long for a closer relationship with God, whatever they conceive him to be. And we long to know God and to exercise greater control over our lives, or at least to know how to respond to the changes that we cannot control, and perhaps how to climb a fence or two to get to our goals. But many people continue to harbor deep-seated feelings that there is something inherently wrong with them. It's, it's as if we don't feel worthy. And God is there just wanting us to experience it in the deepest and most wonderful ways. But there is something within many of us that keeps saying, yes, it's all right for other people, but not for you. You're just not, you're just, you just don't make the grade. And it's something that we really have to, to work on, don't you think, in ourselves, to acknowledge and to affirm constantly, I am worthy, I am enough. I am at, this is the dwelling place the secret place of the Most High, right here in my heart, and it is a worthy temple for the living God. Can we say I am a worthy temple for the living God? Can we say that? I am a worthy temple for the living God. In a half voice, I am a worthy temple for the living God. In a whisper, I am a worthy temple for the living God. Now say it in your heart. You feel the shift in energy for you? We well, you know when I first came here and uh, I, I, I heard so many years ago, 1981, that nothing can separate you from that presence that is within you. I thought, wow, it hit me for six. Because I know that if that is the case, then it means that I don't have to struggle. I don't have to, to strain the creator unconditionally loves you regardless of your age, your race, your creed, your gender, your sexual preference, your social status. As Holmes puts it, the gifts of heaven come alike to us all. And I just think that's, uh, that's such a comforting and empowering and motivational thought to have that God at my is all I need to think about and to, and to express. But you might say, Reverend John, how can you say that all are equal recipients of God's goodness when some have so much while others seem to have so little? And that's a good question. But you know, Jesus the Christ gave us the simple truth. And it is that God is at hand to supply every need. And God is so good that God has to say yes to whatever you, you are, are thinking and focused on. So if you focus on being unworthy, God says yes. And if you focus on being worthy, God says Yes. So we need to erase that business of being not deserving 
uh, which we all have to some extent, perhaps not consciously, but often at the deep subconscious level where our lifelong habitual patterns are deeply entrenched. God is good. There's a charming legend about the rite of passage into manhood of a Cherokee uh, Native American youth. And the story is that this youth's father took him into the forest at sundown, blindfolded him, and the right, the, the right is that he has to sit through the night with the blindfold on. He can't take the blindfold off until the first rays of the sun um, hit his face in the morning. And so you can imagine this youth, he's 13 or 14. This is the rite of passage into manhood for a Cherokee. And he's sitting there, it's, there are blasts of cold air, there are sounds in the, in, the, in the forest, in the woods, perhaps of wild animals. There, there are, he gets drenched by a downpour of rain in the middle of the night, and he sits there terrified, but he cannot remove the blindfold or he will not graduate into manhood. The youth are also forbidden to share their experience with other youth because every youth has to go through it. So he goes through the night, this agonizing night. And you know when you're, you are in that state of mind, time seems to stretch even longer. And so he was there shivering and, and frightened but determined to prove his manhood. And in the morning as the sun rose, and he was sure that the sun was up. He could see the light through, through the, the folds of the blindfold. He pulled it off. And sitting on a stump, a hand's reach from him was his father. The father had sat beside him all through the night. And that is a wonderful image for me because I think about God being there all through the night, all through the day, all through my entire journey. And that is why I think it's so important that if you don't already journal, that you perhaps try this amazing spiritual exercise of journaling your journey in the knowledge that the Father is at the center. And if you stay centered and keep Christ at your center, and Christ not being the name, Jesus' last name, Christ being your sonship or your daughtership, with the living spirit almighty, then all is well. And I, I recommend that practice to you very, very highly. And we're going to include it in our New Year's workshop, uh, an exercise uh, that, that will help you to bring some creativity and some, some joy and some, um, some fun to the business of, of, of journaling. The beautiful Jesus called the God presence he discovered within him Father, because I think that his image was the same as that Cherokee dad sitting with his son all through his, his initiation. And he called it Father because it represented the same kind of loving, nurturing protection conveyed by that Cherokee story. To Jesus, God was not some whimsical personality who behaves like we humans, happy at one moment and displeased the next. Dr. Holmes explains that God is both personal and impersonal. And I, I struggled with this when I first started studying the science, of mind, the science of mind. Because how can God be impersonal? I wanted to feel this warm presence, this, this fatherly love, this, this, this nurturing. But Holmes, and I quote him, says, impersonal from the standpoint that it is universal. And it is personal from the standpoint that this universal life principle is personified in each and every one of us. We make God personal to us. So we can make it warm and fuzzy and, and nurturing uh, because that's perhaps a need that we have. But the impersonal side doesn't care who you are or what you have done in the past. And this is a message that I, we give at the, at the, uh, in the Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life program at the prisons. You are not your past. You are not anything that you have done. You are the beloved of the Father. And that is, is just such an empowering and strengthening thing. In The Science of Mind 365, Ernest Holmes writes, we must come to realize that God is not some far off place but instead that God is an inward, intimate presence closer to us than our very breath. God is not nor can ever be separated from us, but too often we separate ourselves from God. And that's the story of the spiritual lesson of the 
our relationship with God in the, we find in the story of the prodigal son. Remember that story? When the youngest one says, give me what money you have for me and let me go about my business. And what did the father say? What does God always say? Yes. Gives him and he goes off. And of course, uh, as you know, he squanders it all and then comes to his senses and says, my God, look at me here eating slop with the pigs. When my father, in my father's house, even those who serve, are treated better than this. I'm going to go home and, and ask him to forgive me and to take me in as a servant. And the prodigal returns to the father. When we return to the father, do we find him missing? No, when we turn, when we turn back to the God presence, it is there waiting. And when the prodigal arrived, the father threw his arms open. He threw the biggest party he could. He put the, the signet ring of, of the prince stood on his finger and he killed the fatted calf and celebrated the homecoming. And this is really what happens when we come to our senses and decide to return to the center where God has always been enthroned in perpetual splendor. And so there's that golden moment in the story of the prodigal and it's just so wonderful when it says, God didn't, God didn't forgive him. In the story, God doesn't forgive him because God didn't judge him. God didn't blame him. God didn't, the father didn't say, slap his wrists and say, naughty boy, I told you. See, the father just welcomed him home. So when this happens, there can be just this wonderful feeling that uh, this warmth inside you, that you belong to God and that God belongs to you. So, you know, people come to me for counseling and I can tell from their, how they describe their personal relationships and the, way, and the ways they tell me that they are relating to others. I know from what they say, how they feel about their relationship with God. Because if you have a close relationship with God and God is at your center, you will relate to other people in the same way. Because you will say, but God is at the center of this person too. And how would God relate to God but with deep reverence and great love? Let us uh, affirm together, I am never separate or apart from the infinite. Can we say that? I am never separate or apart from the infinite. I know the presence within is the truth of my being. Together? I know the presence within is the truth of my being. I take time to uncover my inner splendor. I take time to uncover my and spend time in silent contemplation of the wonder within. And spend time in silent contemplation of the wonder within. Which brings me to your assignment. And regulars at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living in beautiful Jamaica know I always give an assignment. And your assignment for this week and throughout the Christmas season, should you decide to undertake it, it's to spend time every day in silent contemplation of the wonder within. Just, just, uh, uh, Vance gave us, uh, uh, in our, our quiet time this morning, I find God, I find myself. So that's your assignment, to take that into your quiet time this week. I find God, I find myself. Can we say that? I find God. I find myself. Holmes says in, this, in, a, in his book titled This Thing Called Life, and I quote, the moment one realizes he can use the creative power of his thought to free himself from bondage, that moment he starts on a new adventure. He is giving birth to a new possibility. Wow. To give birth to a new possibility. In our, in our uh, words of wisdom this morning in the inspirational reading, uh, Vance read to us from Howard Thurman's The Mood of Christmas. When Thurman talks about this mysterious thing when a woman gives birth to the splendor. And I just want to quote you the, 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 the final paragraph. The birth of the child in China, Japan, the Philippines, Russia, India, and I dare say, beautiful Jamaica. And all over the world, is the breathless moment like the stillness of absolute motion when something new, fresh, whole may be ushered into the nations that will be the rallying point 
of the whole human race. Just think about that, and I think every mother in this, in this audience will relate to this, that something amazing happens when you bring forth a new life into the world. You know, and I, I think about, and I've told you this story before about the young man in, in, at the general penitentiary who delivered his own, his own son. Remember I told you that story? It was in the middle of a gang war in the neighborhood, so he couldn't get um, the mother out to the, uh, to the hospital. And I love it because he said, I never know what to do. And, and her water's broken, and I knew the, the baby was coming. So the, all of us in the class said, so what you do? What you do? What you do? He said, I boil water. <laughs> We said, you boil water. What you boil water for? He said, I don't know. On TV, you always boil water. So I boil water, boil water, boil water. Every pan I could find, I fill it with water and boil it. And the ultrasound had said it was a girl. But when he delivered the baby, it was a young lad. It was a boy. And he said, Ja, bless me with a young lad. And that young man said, every man should watch his child being born and there would be no more abuse of women on the face of the earth. Wow, you're 27 years old and you, you have that aha about the birth, the mystery, the miracle of bringing forth a child. And if that is not what life is about, my friends, and if you have any doubt about there being a creative force, call it God, call it Jah, call it whatever you want to call it, Buddha, um, you call it what you like. That creative force that brings forth a newborn being. And I want Christmas to just remind us of that. That being reborn in our very souls, in our very hearts at this time is something so joyous, so beautiful, so rare, so awesome in its beauty that we can only give thanks that it is part of us as we are part of it. And the wonderful thing, my friends, is you don't have to climb a fence to get there. Just sit quietly in your meditation this week and find God and find the spirit of the Christ born anew in the manger of your hearts and know that God is with you and at your center all the time. Namaste.